Yeah, I I agree with you. So after the fact, I was just trying to make a hit, a few of them available for thought. But I think what he was also saying, or maybe what I was thinking, was to market them before we closed, and so that they could choose their name. But what are we trying to achieve? We already, like, I, I don't understand. Are we trying to okay. sell a few more coins? I mean, we already sold out. And so if we market, we could market them to let people know about their existence and have a cutoff date, that sounds great. If we have, like, a hard okay. cutoff date and we already exceeded it, we already exceeded what our original plan on numbers were, you know, and... We did. But what's that? I said we did, yeah. We were about halfway through on both of them, on, on the silver and gold, which were double. But I mean, but the pre-increase, uh, yeah. and, and that's what I mean. And so if we if we want to market it to kind of like spread the word on the project and the fact that we can do these and, and that people can get them and that it's a great deal before they're gone, you know, before like it's closed and, and, the, and the 2021s are over, then I think... That sounds like reasonable marketing because it's about awareness. But if we're worried about selling any single coin right now, I mean, I want to buy. I'm, I'm worried about making sure I get ones that I can get for gifts and stuff. But if we're worried about selling any single coin right now, that seems like the wrong place to put our concerns or energy. You know, it seems more like it's it's both a benefit for, in my opinion, for me to be able to get one of these, you know, any of these um, earlier, like now in this year. And, you know, if it comes or doesn't either way, I, you know, I got to order it in this year and I know that it's coming. That to me seems like a benefit to me. And then it seems like a benefit to the project. If we use the fact that we can make these, that we can do this and they're so damn cool you know um as marketing that seems like a benefit to the project but i don't know about uh and, and you know obviously there's going to be some amount of of donation appreciate that and you know to the to the foundation which will go back into the community and the project but i don't um i don't know that you know being about selling them rather than maybe, I mean, sure, we can say what's so cool about them and why they're so cool and everything. And we could let people know that they're, you know, that they're already, um, we've already upped the number and there's a date now as you know, that is the cutoff or something that seems all good to me. And if you want to buy some for the store that you feel have names that somehow, you know, mean, mean something to you or that you want to just do, that's obviously your choice. It seems that's your choice. But it just seems if we go out and we try to hawk these coins as coins or we try to sell coins, then it, it just seems like, um, you know, the only thing that can happen is, oh, did... Did you sell all the coins you can make? No, we're never, we're never going to sell all the coins we can make. But we sold out more than we actually ever expected to make and wanted to make on this run. And it, and it really isn't about having more. Having more was just actually as like a favor to people. And I feel like we're if we twist it around, it just ends up being a negative somehow. Oh, agreed. That works. I was just uh, asking the question. I, I'm just stating my opinion. That's just my view on it because I see that if we if we are perceived as trying to sell coins and, you know, like we've already sold most of the coins we're going to sell and so we're like out trying to sell coins and the few people who learn about us say, oh, that's really cool and they buy a few coins. It's like we just kind of look – I feel like it kind of makes our community look lame when, in, in fact, we could be out, like, really helping people understand what this is, that it's done, that it, you know, that's also a time we can talk about it, I think. I think uh, there's one more thing uh, to uh, consider, and that is uh, 
if people want to have a coin when they're not able to buy it through the store, they have to use the marketplace and they have to rely on people that are willing to offer theirs on the marketplace. And by not overrunning the amount of numbers and not flooding the market with coins for everyone who wants one, uh, you create that market as well. And it's, it, it, it's, uh, it stays an exclusive uh, NFT. It stays limited. And it's just cool to show off that, say, okay, I've got an NFT and I put it on the marketplace and uh, somebody on the other side of the world bought it and I sent uh, the, the, the gold coin or the silver coin or the bronze coin that is attached to that NFT to that guy. Uh, those are stories that can make uh, uh, that are more valuable to the community, to the chain, to the technology, than selling another coin because he wants one. I agree. That makes sense too. I think the um, just so you know, I mean, you're right that people can use the marketplace to do that, but once you have a physical uh, object. You know, this is something just to mention, by the way, once you have a physical object and you've got to trust that the person's going to send it, you can use the marketplace and it's probably the best way to do it. I mean, it is the best way to do it if you have any question at all, because then you at least separate those two things, but it still doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the physical thing unless you figure out a way to make sure that's going to happen. Yeah, I fully agree on that. But uh, from all the NFT marketplaces I've seen, I feel that this would be uh, the one that requires the least amount of trust. You still got to trust the other guy. Yeah, it's true. And the, and the object that you send is worth less to both when it's separated. So there's that too. So, Rosso, uh Cut-off date is a week, so that will be Wednesday at what time? Because I think that should be put up on the shop uh, at some point, uh, that there's a cut-off time and when it actually is. Yeah, I was just initially thinking a week. Um, we did it on Tuesday, Wednesday. The only other thing I'm thinking about is if we do Wednesday, as I'm looking at the calendar, Thursday's Thanksgiving. So it's not like I'm going to get the order in that fast. Unless... I, really think, but I really think it's best just to set a date and stick to the date. There's literally, yeah. I can't think of a reason to make it go longer unless someone else says there's a reason that, that, that make, you know, that is somehow so positive. Wednesday should be plenty of time. So do the 24th then. We can set it as that. I have someone who has a birthday on the 25th, so I'll make sure to get one before then. I was just going to say, though, I, what I was initially going to say was why not leave it until Friday, the 26th, which was Black Friday, which is like the biggest sale day. Online sale day. But it's up to you. Uh, yeah, well, that might, yeah, maybe that's a, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, personally, uh, Black Friday, it starts uh, this weekend. It started yesterday, Black Friday, because mm -hmm. those shops, they, they, they stretch out Black Friday for two weeks. One, one week in front and one week behind uh, the actual Black Friday. And uh, it's just another excuse to, to make people spend in their stores. I think that is a kind of commercial endeavor that I do not wish, I do not think the community should be involved in. We're not having a sale. I was just thinking a lot of people shop that day. Yeah, I, but I, I, I think, I think um, it's, it wouldn't go against anything. I said, if you, for example, I'm not saying, I, I'm, I don't have an opinion one way or another, actually, between Wednesday or Friday, if you on your store, you know, just put a date, just whatever the date. I think Wednesday's fine for me. I think, you know, if, if Friday makes it easier for you 
And what and if Oink is really against Friday, if other people are for yeah. Friday, you probably should speak up because I I have no input into the uh, choice of the date. I just think you should choose a date and stick to it and just yeah. make it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I agree. Uh, just put a date and stick to it. Uh, for the record, I'm not against Friday. Uh, I'm against extra marketing because it's like Black Friday to appeal to the no, no, uh, commercial. No, okay. uh, yeah. So I don't the object against Friday. Let me put it that way. People have a four day weekend and they'll have already gotten through Thanksgiving. And people are more relaxed and wanting to hang out, shop, and do stuff on the, you know, the Friday. All right, so with that said, then I need time to get the order ready for Monday, the 22nd. So why don't we just cut it off on Saturday, say at like noon Eastern Standard, or I'll figure out the UTC time and I'll post it. That way it'll give everybody around the world some time until the end of Friday, a little bit into Saturday. Be done. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, especially since uh, she two comments in the marketing channel that they would like it uh, to go on through uh, to at least Friday. Okay. That works. I'll set a date and a time and stuff, and um, that'll give me you know 48 hours to get everything ready, and then off on the 22nd. Sounds good, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, just also to kind of, I guess, be clear, though, when we were saying Friday the 20th, we're also talking about the bronze and the silver uh, coins. So all coins have to be obviously done and paid for by that date on the cutoff time so that we can have everything submitted, done, and ready for Monday. So that will be a complete cutoff time. Um, all right, so... We have Thanksgiving coming up next week. Um, do we you guys want to do anything for Thanksgiving? Are there any thoughts along those lines? Or and Mike, why you, I'll ask you personally. Honestly, I haven't been really a, the, a big instigator ever for the holidays, even though I love the holidays and, you know, and I, I love the whole giving thanks and that, you know, and I did that in different countries when I lived in different countries, but it was about giving thanks and all that. But um, I'm not really that great at figuring out, I don't know, the events around the holidays and other people in the community have been really good at doing that. Um, so, if, you know, we want to, if other people have ideas, um, I'd be happy to support, participate or any of those things. Um, in whatever we might do. Yeah, I kind of jumped. Well, off. I got a, uh, I, I, I got an idea. It's, it's pretty premature right now. Uh, it just sprang to my head, but um, I, I don't want to put it in as a competition. But uh, if people want, they could make NFTs uh, with their holiday theme. And, and, and that might be a present if they want to give it on Thanksgiving. They can give it on Thanksgiving if they want to give it on Christmas or Hanukkah or Chinese New Year. I don't I don't care. But that is, uh, you could create a, an NFT with that and use it for that. So it's it's not necessarily a, an, an activity, but it's just more like an idea that. Uh, and we can promote that idea, of course, and say, okay, uh, I created a couple of NFTs uh, with this theme and that theme and that theme, and I'm going to give it away to my loved ones at those days. Could I make a suggestion related to that? <clears throat> if it's, are you, like, we've done these picture, you know, the either video or picture for Halloween, and I think we had some around last Thanksgiving, and you know, I saw some Christmas stuff or Hanukkah. I didn't actually see much Hanukkah stuff and Diwali would just went by and it would be nice to, you know, as we're doing stuff, maybe think of these other things too. But anyways, on this one, if we're gonna do, if we're gonna do anything to promote NFTs, I think as a mark, you know, this is the marketing call. 
I think we need to understand um, where we are and what is something that I think is reasonable to promote and set expectations on and what we can do and also what might, in my opinion, possibly turn into like a little bit of a backfire. And <clears throat> so we can make great NFTs and we have the ability to do things with NFTs that no other platform can do with the revocation, the recovery, the marketplace and these things. But we have zero user-friendly tools for websites like OpenSea yet to make NFTs easy for people to make, which means that making really cool NFTs right now should, like if we are gonna really think that we're gonna have really cool NFTs that we will you know, market, unless it's maybe the whole program of these things as being NFTs, but the challenge is that the only people who are really gonna make um, NFTs at all, let alone you know the subset of those people who will make cool ones by most people's kind of perception is going to be limited to the people who will um, invest, who will care enough to invest in, you know, learning how and putting those together, which right now is like work in progress. And, and the people who are working on making that. Um, so hopefully there will be people making the tools on top. Well, there will be people making really cool metaverse tools, but I'd like to see, you know, more and more tools on top of that. Um, you know, they're probably not going to be uh, spending a lot of time with anyone to try and make it easier. And so if we try to make it a thing, like everybody should go to Verus and make NFTs right now, like the mass market, we don't have mass market experience of making NFTs. And we need to understand that, that our NFTs are more capable, more powerful, and can be all of the cool NFTs that anyone has. But the process of making them, we could put together tutorials, maybe in this kind of thing, and that might actually make it possible. Um, or somebody could make some really simple tools, actually, which would be pretty cool. But, uh, you know, no one that I know of has made those. Um, I know that Albitz and Craig Orn were working on uh, instructions on how to make an ID profile, NFT, this kind of thing. But I don't believe that these are going to be yet in a state where we as a community would want to have this be our, you know, our experience debut and a clarion call to everyone in the world to try and use it as the best new NFT platform because a lot of people that will color their first impression by the fact that, you know, that might be a lot harder than they thought when in fact, if there are NFTs that somebody wants to make. So for example, if we had a contest, you know, that would be like actually a real contest with a bounty and everything for creating, you know, a meaningful or some, I don't know, something, some kind of, of graphic or, or some kind of thing, then it would be great to turn that into an NFT, you know, and also let the artist who made it um, and got a bounty for winning the contest participate in even a percentage of, the sale of that NFT, which can be done, you know, something like that. Um, that seems like more possible to put together in a way where it's a lot easier for someone to buy an NFT or to, you know, trade an NFT or to, um, you know, use IDs and buy and sell IDs right now than it is for anyone to think that like the mass market is ready yet to come and start making the NFTs. Artists sure can, we can help people who will make high value and people in the community can make them for their friends and family and everything else. But that's a point I wanted to make that we really should understand. And, I, and I'd, I'm happy to talk about a little bit more about kind of thinking around plans through the end of the year and beyond. But 
I just want us to understand like the power we have in the NFTs is definitely everything that we say, but what we are really missing right now, kind of <clears throat> in many areas when it comes to, um, I mean, we're missing kind of two main things that are priorities right now. Um, you know, as I'm gonna, just gonna say the first one and we can talk about the others later. The first one is um, related to this. We need the experiences. We need people to contribute and make easy experiences to do these things that people want to do. And then we need to organize these into, you know, startups and um, we can offer bounties for people who make great experiences. But, you know, we just should know that if we go out and say that this is, you know, that we would want people to come to the platform and start making all these NFTs, that Oink, you're gonna be absolutely swamped trying to help everyone, number one. And number two, it not, it's not necessarily at all putting a good foot forward because we have so many great feet to put forward about what we actually have and the capabilities and the fundamental capabilities that, you know, focusing on our user experience as the thing and pointing everyone to that might not be the best thing to do in that way. Just a thought. No, indeed, I understand. Basically, uh, we have the capabilities, we just don't have the interface for the users yet. That's what it boils down to. Um, that being said, uh, there's holidays all over the years for all kinds of cultures. So whenever we have those tools, we can uh, we could do something like this. Uh, or we could even... do something now to try and get those tools and also get, I mean, we're not just going to have those tools. Someone's going to make those tools. So that's, an, an, that's something we need to think about, you know, promoting making of tools. And then on the, the idea that you had around making NFTs, what I, I'm not saying we couldn't do something like that. What I'm saying is I would be focused on anything. If anything we're going to talk about in a marketing context, it should be high value NFTs made that people could access rather than trying right now. In it's like kind of Sun Tzu, you know, um, and, and it's not, I mean, I'm not saying this is exactly war, but it's like, you know, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. We have a lot of really, like, we have great strengths. It isn't that we have, um, you know, strengths in every single area. And when it comes to, we have some weaknesses in some areas and we have strengths that, like, nobody has. And so we should be, I think, focusing on our strengths. And when it comes to NFTs, you know, if if we make ourselves look like um, the hard to use platform that we're trying to promote NFTs on or making NFTs on, then that's what people will start to form an opinion of us as. If we actually show that our NFTs, like I, I know a guy who used to work with Richard Branson and a number of other people, and he's like, you know, I've known him for years, and he started up a company to do lending, um, uh, like home lending uh, with NFTs and he's got, you know, the funding to do it and everything else. Now I'm not saying that um, he's joining the community and he's gonna do it on this platform, but you know, I'm gonna be talking to him because our NFTs can enable him in ways that no other NFTs can. And you know, that's a strength that we can talk, we can talk about what we're able to do but if we try to like, we're not just crappy little GIF NFTs. And so if we try to like make everyone use us as if we are, then we're just gonna look bad compared to the people who have optimized for being, you know, easy to use crappy little GIF NFTs. And, and that's not ever what we, at least what I ever wanted us to make anyways, cause I don't even believe that's actually a real market. I think it's kind of a, a bubble in anticipation of the real NFTs, which we are, I think, delivering we just don't have that you know same user interface and that will come either when we convince people to do it or when people join the community 
or when companies start up to do it, but it isn't going to just appear. And so I'm just saying, if we think about what our strengths are on the marketing side, that is the stuff we should be putting forward. And so related to NFTs, if we're going to have a contest, we're going to do something around, you know, Thanksgiving in some way, we should be a little bit, you know, aware of changing narratives around things. We should do maybe a contest. And if we, and if we come up with something that's worthy of it, we make it into an NFT, you know, and then, I don't know, auction it as a historical step, like a milestone, you know, step in our, in the growth of our community or something like that, you know, on the marketplace, because then we can, we, our marketplace is part of the strength, you know, some higher value result of a lot of gifts or JPEGs or videos or things like that is, is a, you know, part of it. And, um, and it creates something that might, you know, it's a kind of a memorabilia of that time, but just a couple of thoughts about that. So I guess my yeah, suggestion. I, I kind of yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah, I kind of agree to have uh, some NFTs available uh, as as early examples, as as early specimens. Let me put it that way, uh, on the first chain, uh, which the gold, silver, and bronze ones already are, but they have a physical object attached to it. Um, I do think that if we uh, make some NFTs available, and, and that's going to be pretty centralized because we simply do not have the ways uh, for, for everyone to create them easily yet, uh, they people should be able to uh, offer them and, 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 and accept the offers and, 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 and make an, uh, um, to do that in a GUI. Let me put it that way. Sorry. I'm have a hard time in uh, formulating myself right now. So now maybe a tad too early, people need to be able to conveniently use them from within the wallet and at a later stage, indeed, in a very friendly user interface on whatever platform. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the the thing that I'm also saying. And, and uh, just as an example, Okay, so we were uh, we were talking to Heiner, you know the the person who um, founded uh, Digital Nation Entertainment and is you know announced in the last marketing meeting the partnership with Value Archetype and uh, and John Geta and you know the CyberXR and and all their future metaverse work and this and and we were talking about okay this is the kind of and you know because we're obviously talking about having avatars and things that avatars can own and um nfts in virtual space but in you know like galleries that you might be able to walk around in and this kind of thing as nfts and being able to use the marketplace APIs to, you know, buy and sell these things. And, um, you know, it's really, there, there are kind of multiple modes that we can be in as a project. So we're this open worldwide project and we're building this technology that is actually different, capable, but it's different than the way that a lot of other people are trying to do things. It helps us to do more with fewer resources, but at the same time, and it also enables um, capabilities that other people are still trying to solve. But at the same time, uh, you know, we have not been focused on delivering the mass market experience like an experience that is mass market on top of the various platform. And that is exactly what we need to be thinking of right now, because the platform, you know, we've had, uh, the, the other thing we need 
and it's really, really important. And people think about it in terms of exchanges or this. I mean, we need liquidity, meaning we need, um, you know, free flowing amounts of value, whether that's in dollars or Ethereum, you know, or other currencies. We need that on the network. And that was the ETH bridge. But as people saw in the marketing channel, um, I don't really see with, I, I don't see how the ETH bridge is going to be done because the um, work that was being done on it was uh, basically, it wasn't possible to do other work while the ETH bridge work was going on. And so unless we find people who can work on the, on that and really kind of finish that independently, then I'll finish it when we finish these other pieces, but it is not in a state yet that it can be on main. It works great on test net, um, but there, it needs to be completed before we can roll it out to main net. And at the same time, you know, so it's basically, what do we need? It's not exactly the ETH bridge. It's not exactly like exchanges or these things, which was the reason that we did took that approach was rather than focusing all our energy on trying to sell people on exchanges and do the centralized route, it's liquidity. And so, you know, we've talked about, all right, so now we have this metaverse partnership. They need mass market. They need mass market because they, they don't care about, um, you know, why they just want to be able to reach the most people. It's always about for some many businesses reach the most people. Now we've been about building the best platform and now building the best platform has to mean, has to meet, reach the most people has to be. And so when we think about like, if we're going to sell NFTs, we're not just going to get a little website. I mean, we might, we might, people can build them, please. Craghorn, you know, uh, you know, please build a, a marketplace website, you know, and I'll, I'll help you understand how to do that. You know, people can, can certainly build, I mean, you, you have, <laughs> it is Craigslist. So I don't know. It's really, it could, it could evolve into something, you know, like anyways, I don't know. Um, but but basically, we can have these kinds of things, but that is not using our desktop GUI and downloading and using our desktop GUI. It enables us to do a lot, but it is, you know, it's what's brought us this far. And it's time to kind of change our perspective on what is the experience we're trying to enable. And the. You know, when we started this project uh, nearly, you know, it's going to be four years ago, not coming up on, um, you know, what was mass market had not been determined in terms of experiences around crypto. And there has been billions of dollars, you know, pushed into the space in marketing, in building on all sorts of different kinds of platforms and all sorts of different disconnected as well as some connected efforts to create everything from experiences to technologies. And it seems really clear right now that when you see the explosion of NFTs and these other things, this is, this is finance meets technology meets user experience you know that's what's happening and this is the emergence of a mass market an acceptably mass market user experience and and you know um heiner really brought it up as i was showing him because uh, michael toot jr and dude have been working on um the uh login and, it, and it's really cool. You know, you got the desktop there and on, you know, from a website, which is going to be integrated with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, as we originally planned, you know, you can, you can basically um, log in and the login process 
you know, pops up a window on your desktop that allows you to select your ID and you click OK and you're in and there's no password and it's more secure than if there was a password. And, you know, they know your Varus ID and they can communicate with it and do all of those things and you can send money and they can send money and, and all of that. And, and so I was showing Heiner that and I'm thinking, you know, the ease of selecting the Varus ID. And he said, but, but we need to have an extension, you know, a web extension on the marketplace because that's what everybody's used to. And it, it took me like about, I don't know, maybe 500 milliseconds to realize that he's absolutely correct because it's a difference in the requirements of what he needs to achieve for his business versus building the best platform because that isn't actually, he wants to build the best metaverse platform as he builds a big business and he needs the underlying capabilities that Varus provides, but we together need to then turn that into the mass market experience that will enable enough people to be interacting with our NFTs and our NFT marketplace versus other like less capable NFTs and other easier to use NFT marketplaces so that we actually end up with correct price discovery and correct and we need the liquidity to be able to do that so that our technology and our NFTs actually demands the prices that make people realize as it happens that it is in fact better and the market is speaking and if we don't understand that that's the you know that we need to solve those things and we don't solve those things and we try to go out and market it then what's going to end up happening is that you know we just won't be taken seriously and it, and then when we have all those things the fact that we went out and tried to basically say that that we have like we do have a marketplace we do have these things but what we have is we have these capabilities and we don't want to go out and say oh we don't have the experience you know the user experience but when someone comes we should be up front and straightforward I mean, we don't have to market the fact that we don't accept in the sense that we want people building these things but we have people building these things right now we've actually probably got some of the best people in the world building these things and committed to building them on the various platform with digital nation entertainment working on that you know and I've got a meeting with devs on there uh, in like multiple places on Monday. And, you know, we're, and we've talked about the web extension plan and, um, and Michael Toot Jr. Took, uh, took some real time to go in and, and dive into the, um, the fork that we will be starting with for the, for the web extension and integrating, uh, PBAS and identities and and I'm going to now that uh, now that we have Vault in the shape that it's you know that it's in and going to mainnet um, you know I'm going to be doing two things I'm going to be focusing on separating uh, DeFi we want to get the liquidity which means okay if we're not going to have the ETH bridge in this year then we still want to have the liquidity flowing. And so we're looking at the, you know, okay, what would it take to enable, um, like get a, get a release out that enables DeFi, that enables Varus D, or if that isn't able to get in place fast enough, another stable coin that can go from, um, and actually have kind of a different plan for even other many other currencies but that can go from you know the wallet to the platform easily and back easily just you know you've got your your easy to access account you can move things in and out with your other bank accounts you can go from your wallet to the blockchain in minutes and you can go from the blockchain back to your wallet 
in however long it takes to do like a finalized confirmation of the blockchain. And, and that gives us some amount of liquidity, but it doesn't give us yet a direct path to all the currencies that we really want to have that direct path to. And so, um, you know, that gives us the ability to have marketplaces with any amount of money flowing in uh, it, with marketplaces, but it doesn't really give us that free flow yet um, to the entire rest of the crypto ecosystem. And so I'm not going to say that we have a solution for that right away um, besides the ETH bridge yet, but what I will say is that we're looking at um, alternatives. And so the thinking is to enable digital nation entertainment to really get moving, there's the user experience side. And, you know, Michael Toot Jr. looked into the extension and came to the conclusion that with the ID model, we could really integrate um, with that kind of an experience, but I think in a much better way where you effectively get benefit, you get the benefits of the ID, but you get um, the kind of interaction model that people are becoming used to now. And of course, we'll still have the mobile wallet. And I believe that we would keep the desktop for some period of time, but it turns out, I, I, think, I think we probably need to keep the desktop um, GUI for some indefinite period of time, but we might, you know, say a year down the road, um, want just different people in the community to just step up and, and keep moving it forward because maybe, you know, core development in the community might move on to, because it turns out that if we go that direction, then we end up moving a lot of the technology that's in our desktop into the, um, uh, react uh, browser extension but the desktop has native of course but interestingly um, although the browser extension user model doesn't really it's not capable enough to really handle our native model it, it actually can connect to and leverage a native wallet running on your local machine which i didn't know until uh, he had looked into that and so, you know, maybe in a year, a year down the road or something like that, you know, we might, we might want to switch over. The point being, we have to think about our real strengths and our, and our real weaknesses because we have real strengths that we can go out and, and you know, like scale and security and the vault and Barris IDs and the ability to have these permanent profiles, the ability to have these nfts and that are you know contracts and the marketplace to exchange contracts and nfts but the marketplace and its value is likely to be so powerful but also not the mass market experience such that it might be really important and useful to people who actually need to do i don't know home lending you know through contracts on the blockchain because it's pretty much almost turnkey ready for that kind of an application except for the experience and that's hard for them to do but at the same time um you know we need to fill in the mass market gaps on the experience we've got people who need that working with us and their time frame lines up with a time frame that should be really reasonable for us to be able to get that in place and they've got developers and I think having their developers working on that as well will help their developers understand the platform and its similarities and differences to Ethereum or Polygon or other things. And, um, and so I just think it's important for us to, to understand where as a community where we are, you know, no hype, no, and, and I know we don't do that. I'm not saying we do. I'm saying just really to understand where we are, that we, you know, we're in a good position with the technologies, but we are 
we are late on our liquidity plan and that doesn't, it, you know, it, it, we're adapting, we are adapting. And, um, and, you know, in a, in a sense, uh, that by the time we're done, um, I think we'll be in better shape because of the partnerships and, and the decision to agree. I mean, I actually had this discussion because, you know, I'm, I'm an individual contributor, just like anyone else in the community. And, you know, I might work all the time and, and, and do, um, I, I mentioned, I am going to take a holiday this holiday season, but I haven't actually in, you know, three and a half years or so really, aside from just going play, you know, with uh, people who did and, and then continuing to kind of focus on things. But, um, you know, where we are right now, I think we're in a good position, but we need to get things done more than anything else. It's not about, it's not about marketing except for just what we are, what we have, what we are doing, the coins, you know, our capabilities, um, really getting the word out about our, our technologies and actually the partnership that was announced. I mean, we don't want to steal anyone's thunder you know, because they are working on um, PR value and uh, DNA are working on the professional side of, you know, the announcement and getting that out properly and everything else. But that was not a non-disclosure, you know, um, agreement. And we're going to be putting in place uh, co-development, like channels for metaverse work that I'm hoping we'll get people into and, and pretty busy. And so I think there's a lot of exciting stuff to talk about and I'm, and we are working to get, um, I'm working and we are working to get the DeFi technologies, which have been actually ready for hardening and release to mainnet in place and ready to go as soon as possible. And then looking at what else might be possible. But the first step is like being able to focus on building things. Um, probably I'm in the near future. I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of a more quiet mode again and, you know, just really be focused on um, building things. If anyone has, you know, our developer or have developer friends who really are, you know, independent, want to contribute, want to earn bounties in the process. Um, let us know, let me, you know, let other people who are developing know, um, you know, Inglal would be good, myself, um, uh, Asher, or, but I mean, if you let me know, I'll definitely follow up on anyone who you believe is a good developer looking to do some work and contribute. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're, we're going to be working as efficiently as we can up until, you know, sometime in mid to late December, late December, I mean, probably mid December, things might slow down and then to late December and then you know, I think there's going to be somewhat of a break besides obviously making sure that everything's um, working smoothly and being available for anything that any, you know, hopefully non-existent thing that might need attention or anything like that. Um, but I think this year, if we can get these pieces together or we can get, you know, these pieces plus marketplace and some really amazing nfts along the lines of some of the things that i've seen that i'd love to be able to have as nfts with rights and other things on our platform um and also even the you know the coin nfts that we've made um i think this is we've achieved an incredible amount already and i think that there's more that we could potentially really do this year and I'm going to be working to do that. But when it comes to marketing, I think 
if we can focus on what we have, what we're capable of, what we do, and understand that we're looking for business. Like if somebody, yes, I think Chris mentioned Rarible, you know, any, any deal with anybody, it's like, we can mention it, we can talk about what it is, but unless somebody goes and does business development or writes code to enable it or something like that, then it's good to talk about, but it isn't going to happen until that happens. And so with Rarible, I think we might not be in a position to go to them and say, you know, hey, you should do this. Like we could go to them and, and say, this is the best platform that does things NFTs don't do. And, it, and my guess is that Rarible won't, they don't really care about that. They care about what's the volume of the GIFs and JPEGs. And if it turns into something else that is high volume and high, high dollar and has liquidity on its platform, you know, that'll be the one. But it's not going to be these are better because they can do all these things and they're going to care. It's going to be, you know, do you plug into uh, Wallet Connect? Do you plug? And I think that's fair, actually. And I don't think it's bad for us. I think it's just, it just means that we're very close. We all want to be already there. We're very close. When the best platform meets the best experience, that's when things, I think, everything changes. And we've got to get there. So that's kind of my little uh, discussion and description and, you know, um, elucidation of the post that I made in marketing uh, yesterday. So, of course, open to questions, thoughts, or other people's opinions about that same stuff too, or other stuff. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... That's a sound reasoning, and I think that's it's a solo way to go forward. Let me put it that way. In short, I agree. To me, it's really like we should not be content with doing something that is less than world class at this point in experience and promoting it because we're working with world-class metaverse developers and, you know, content creators. And, you know, they want to work with us on world-class experiences. And, you know, some of us, including me, have been involved in developing, you know, with, with the Windows eHome division, we made a completely new, um, remote control driven experience and that version of windows that we released actually got the highest customer satisfaction of any versions of windows and you know sometimes you're working on the technology and the platform and we're going to continue to do that until we get to the point where you know the whole world is joining us because everybody is now realizing that they want this as the foundation and then to extend on top of it and then but i think it's really time for that you know, it's time for us to really be thinking in terms of mass market user experiences because we're going to focus on being big, not a small project forever, you know. And I think that's that's a change in the way that we need to be thinking about things that will drive the things that we do and the way that we, um, the, even the way that we, you know, connect with other groups, but I think that's really what we have to be doing right now. And I think we can, I mean, I believe we can. It's just, you know, there's a process and everything doesn't always go in a straight line. So I think that that's what I'm thinking. Anyways, that's actually like all I really had um, that I wanted to bring to the meeting aside from, you know, the idea I wanted to ask since I didn't hear any questions about that, I'm, you know, people can obviously ask more, but um, let's see, I see something. Ah, I see, uh, Spike did have a question. Uh, let me see. Okay, I see a couple of, I'm sorry, I didn't notice these. Um, Yeah, so it's it's space. So a few things. Um, 
So yes, I agree with the comments down. Lynn asked the question. Uh, Lynn, the key is really what the IDs and the NFT technology and the deep, it's basically the entire, it's the platform. I mean, this, if you hear Nick talk, Consilience talk, um, you know, he's got his, I'd say he's got his finger on the issues that um, are the issues. Those are exactly the discussions that they had, that we had, and, and that's what made them realize that this platform enables you know, I mean, there's not really even another platform that I know of that in the way that we do enables, in fact, at all, I don't know of a, a platform that could enable you to have an avatar that owns uh, any number of real world assets and other, you know, quote, IDs or quote, NFTs or contracts saying they own, you know, skyscrapers, whatever it happens to be. An avatar in the metaverse can actually own these things, just like on these NFTs, the, you know, the gold coin NFTs, the two rounds are effectively two different, loosely connected pseudonymous DAOs. Um, you know, the, these are things that you can't do that I know of. You know, I mean, I'm not saying I've, I'm aware of every single project, but looking at the different standards, what people are doing, and what has been built. I'm, I don't know of any other solution that would allow you to have a an avatar that you could transfer with all of an unlimited number of belongings that it fully controls, giving you know cryptographic and algorithmic control to another person with one transaction on a completely peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. I mean, that's pretty amazing and it's pretty unheard of. And so that, you know, these are the things. So now it's time, like I said, best platform needs to meet best user experience. And that's a phase that we have to be, we have to push ourselves to and bring people in to help create because it's, as this, I think, continues to be, you know, bubbling out towards the real user experience that it can start to enable, I think it's going to get more and more exciting. Um, Craghorn, you know, look, I, I would love to see any of the exposed, um, you know, technologies or, or even the marketplace, even if it ends up that, you know, you have a marketplace on Craigslist that, that um, has some fee associated with it, but becomes easier to use all of these kinds of things. I mean, there are so many things. And, and also you've been helping. You've been helping. So uh, thank you for your help. And um, we can talk about those things. And then uh, Spike, the questions about marketing MEV. Yes, MEV resistance. Yes. I mean, it's, it's not even just MEV. There's a, there was a tweet where someone is saying if, if, a, if a validator, block producer, meaning, you know, like a staker, a miner, um, can arbitrage and make money without harming the people, then they don't consider that MEV. And literally, by the definition I saw in that tweet, we have zero MEV. It's not even MEV resistance. Now, I don't agree, but I'm always looking for every different possible. Based on what people call MEV today, I do not believe that we should go out and say that we're um, MEV free because of, you know, shifting definitions because everybody wants to define themselves out of it and all of this and the fact that um i mean it's conceivable that you could do kind of set something up for like you get like a uh even though you don't have uh kind of anti-collusion between miners you could you could probably create some kind of mutually beneficial minor and staker collusion opportunities and these kinds of things. But I'm just saying that compared to other platforms, we've had the MEV solution on our test net for way too long. And now we need to get it out to mainnet. And that is definitely, you know, the high priority right now is to get that, get the technologies that are really ready, have been ready and, and, and we're, you know, 
um, waiting for kind of these whole things to come together. Um, get those to mainnet. Uh, I don't know if that means with or without PBAS, but I kind of would not. I mean, the idea was first, you know, Ethereum bridge, then PBAS. Then the idea was PBAS to help the Ethereum bridge. And then now the idea is, well, we could get PBAS out, I believe, possibly even before the Ethereum bridge. But um, I think that would be better to get uh, um, the Ethereum bridge and PBAS out together. I really do. I think that would be a better way to have those come out. And so I think that what would be a good approach is to say, okay, can we get, you know, DeFi and liquidity this year and the knowledge that we are on track for an early next year release to mainnet of those both. And that is what, that's what I am doing everything I can to enable while we also work to enable the user experience that we're talking about. So um, uh, let's see. Yeah, and as far as you know, the the work with Jonathan Scott. Jonathan has offered to help. We've asked. We've we've um, accepted, and, and we're happy uh, to have discussions and to help. Um, he understand. You know, he's offered to look and audit things and, and help in that way. But it's really he's an individual. He's another community member. I mean. And, and so he's also quite busy, it seems, uh, you know, on the Twitter side of things. And, and so, yeah, we want him to be um, looking for vulnerabilities. And, you know, the one challenge might be that, I mean, we want him to, and, and we'll, um, of course, you know, be offering him bounties to do that. The one challenge might be um, he's got, He's got his uh, podcasts and and uh, Twitter and kind of his you know infosec um, work that he's doing and he's committed to helping and we're just still seeing you know where but but what I'm hoping is that one thing that he could help work on would be um, really reviewing you know a lot of these technologies. And it would be very good to have someone with that infosec background um, able to say, "Hey, you know, I understand that 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 stuff's fantastic." So, um, you know, we'd like to get to that point. I don't know. I don't have any concrete um, info on that. I mean, we've had good conversations. We've been, had good discussions. He seems really enthusiastic and uh, supportive. We're happy to have him say that. I didn't. You know, he he mentioned that he was going to. Uh, let us know and then I saw the tweet and so I was happy to see that and um, we should just consider him another you know good guy in the community who's officially supporting and stating he's supporting us so I think that's that's how I look at it right now and and you know we'll hope to have his involvement and engagement on whatever he's able to help with yep thank you and that's all I've got um, unless there are other questions. Uh, one more thing. I did just get uh, news um, that we, I think all of the tests, the, the change that, so TestNet was having some issues. Um, it related to the upgrade between the Veris Vault and PBAS. So it was the, switch to PBAS. And so it's not it's not a mainnet issue, but the uh, update that's coming out and I've just gotten confirmation that all looks good and testnet only, you know, minor stuff, but we recommend this update for everyone, um, but it's a testnet issue. And so uh, that's coming out, I think, probably shortly after we end this call. And, you know, on even on testnet right now, if you're running on the existing um, wallet, you, everything might just be fine. It probably will be. Everything will probably just be fine. Uh, 
but we did call it a mandatory upgrade for testnet more to just avoid issues that somebody might have you're not likely going to be able to hurt testnet by not upgrading but you might end up and and i don't even know if you would there's a high chance you will have no problems but you might end up having an issue and just to avoid the possibility at all you know best just upgrade and so that's coming out and then there is another contest that actually i shouldn't call it a contest um and i and i can't really give all the details unless we know that we really want to do it um it's effectively you could think of it as a scavenger hunt or a treasure hunt and you know we had a plan to do uh kind of a rolling set of these kinds of treasure hunts like for real treasure uh and right now i'm actually wondering um it, it we have so the the goal was to say all right they're they're hard to make these treasure hunts they're very very hard to make okay and uh consilience spent time a lot of time working to make one and i worked with him also spent time on working to make it so we made one of these treasure hunts and so we have basically i think there might be a little bit of you know maybe if we spent another half hour on it we basically have this kind of a of a public global treasure hunt that um would be really uh good for varus um and for awareness but it's one and we had this original thought that maybe we could make multiple and we would do like one every week or because because we really don't know how long the treasure hunt will last um and the amount of varus could be just some amount that we put into this treasure hunt and we could also because of the marketplace we could consider you know launching this treasure hunt along with some like i don't know maybe a coin or something like that that goes along with it or or an, or some special you know id because of the marketplace that goes along with it um but what do people think about the timing of such a thing if we instead of doing you know multiple in a row which probably would have been able to kind of increase interest and awareness each time and just grow like a snowball if we have one to kind of fit it in and then we have no commitment to make another yet to kind of fit it into the other things i'm thinking that that might be a really uh, nice treasure hunt to release um that actually has non crypto or no crypto crossover i think it might be a nice treasure hunt to release maybe um when we release the marketplace you know i'm not release when that goes live on mainnet um do other people have thoughts on that or if the idea about it, i mean thousands thinking of kind of a treasure hunt for some few thousands of varus basically nobody wants a treasure hunt that the role type of marketing yeah mike what's that they're all responding in the marketing channel ah okay definitely want a treasure hunt yeah i can't so the idea would be i can't say all the details except what i can say is that the um an eldor 2011 is asking about what is the defi part uh it might it occurs to me maybe that's a question of what is verus defi i'm not sure um 
I didn't see that before we moved on. Let's go back to that in a minute. Uh, so I can't actually say the details of exactly how the treasure hunt will work. All I can really say is that it's really cool. I mean, it's really cool. And, uh, and I can also say that it's designed to increase if, if someone is going, you could think of it as like a scavenger hunt or a treasure hunt. If someone is going to win, they will need to have some understanding of Varus to win. So I can just say that. Um, I don't want guessing or anything else, please. I don't want to talk about exactly what it is. If anyone wants to, please don't, because I don't want to do 20 questions or I, don't, I just don't want to say right now what it is. Please trust me on that. And whenever we announce it is the time, um, is that time. Okay, R. Scott on board. What would be the best? Ah. Yes. Um, okay. So R. Scott and Crypto 278. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I mean, I feel, uh, I, I thought that we were going to have uh, the Ethereum bridge done this year too. And uh, it had been out of my control for some period of time. And I've done everything I can to try and help make sure that it happened. And I have had, you know, nonstop seven days a week for every single day since the test net released before the bridge released. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I've been doing everything I can to make sure that happens. And so now the only solution that I believe is to, uh, because, you know, it's that it isn't ready. And if it isn't ready, there's no way that we can, like, we could release what we have, you know, now basically, but if we do, uh, if we do release what we have now, then, um, and by the way, I'll, I'll talk about DeFi in a second. I will. Um, if we release what we have now, that would be a bad thing because it would work just as well as like, you know, until some developer figures out everything that I might already have been able to figure out about the things that need to be addressed in the bridge, okay? So the only time that we can release something is when everyone who is working on it truly believes that it's ready to be released and that that will only have positive um, consequences. So it's just not something that, um, you know, there's no way that it's gonna be hardened and ready for release. Uh, well, I shouldn't say no way. I don't believe um, there is. There are possible ways, actually. I mean, it's not impossible, but I don't want to get any. I want. I want to set expectations so that no one gets surprised now, because this is where, this is where I believe that it it it's not the right thing to believe that that will be hardened and ready for release. But DeFi. So what is DeFi? DeFi is all the multi currency. DeFi is all of the currency conversions, the currency launches, and all of that. Um, and separating that from PBAS would mean that does not include the bridge or the blockchain launches. And so just so that everybody understands, because there's a, there are a little change. So it means that it would include, because the multi-currency liquidity baskets and that technology has actually been done for quite some time, um, quite some time. And, and so it basically means the, uh, you know, the hardening where there's a little bit left to do on that. Um, the, so the, the DeFi would be the multi-currency baskets, the um, uh, currencies that would allow something like a stable coin, Veris D, these kinds of things. Um, it would mean the, uh, um, there's one more thing that actually I haven't talked about and I've been thinking about, and I don't, it's a goal, but some of these things you got to understand, I'm going to talk about it. We shouldn't go and say, oh, this is going to be out 
it's a goal and I definitely want to make sure that it's released by PBAS, but I'm thinking about ways that we might be able to do this part sooner. And that is, um, you know, I don't believe, I've, I've, I've concluded that I don't believe it's right for us to just reduce as a protocol. And, and I don't even think I, I would have the power really to do that without like some kind of, of chain wide, you know, um, vote or something to reduce the cost of root virus IDs. I don't think that makes sense. I actually think that it's not a bad thing that they are where they are, but it's really clear that we need inexpensive IDs to be able to be purchased as part of this mass market enabling push. You know, we wanna be able, like mass market doesn't just mean a nice pretty screen. It means really all of the factors that will enable, you know, normal, even no crypto people to be able um, to use things. And some of the factors that will enable businesses to create those um, to create those things. I, I see, you know, comments about uh, chains enabling cheaper IDs. Yes, we can do that. Um, in fact, it is even conceivable that we could release PBAS if we were going to pull things forward. It would take a little more work, but PBAS is also in quite good shape the problem is that I really am concerned about releasing something like PBAS and before we have the ETH bridge in place to release something like PBAS that would um, mean that you know more projects come and start. And it doesn't mean that they're all gonna be successful, but it means that they're all gonna have extra, uh, you know, they're going to bring extra requirements. They're all going to bring extra requirements that are not the same requirements as what we've got on the Varus chain. So it's going to be overhead without necessarily being able to expand the overall economy of Varus. It's, it's the experience of, it's the user experience and liquidity in my mind that, and then having those meet with a completely functional, powerful platform that will enable the, economy to really really get to the next level that's what i believe we need and and so um what i'm thinking and the other thing is that you know if i've got an id i've got a varus root id so i can make a currency you know or i can make a um a pbas chain in when pbas is out or i could make um you know, an NFT out of it. Well, so what if I could make a currency that also would allow people to make sub IDs? Because if I make a currency, I'm probably not making a blockchain out of it. And if I make a currency on chain, maybe I should also be able to sell IDs with my currency that automatically get imported into um, the blockchain. And so there's not really an import, you just get like, uh, you know, um, I mean, we could even have, you know, NFT currency that maybe could make name.nft at. Um, this isn't done, it's just, I'm, I'm really thinking about how to, get this in in smoothly in a way that would kind of streamline like it would be streamlined or slip streamed in kind of the along with this pulling of this other stuff back i'm really my, my brain is churning on how to how to make this you know as great as it can be in kind of the time frame we're looking at and so the idea would be that um you know we could conceivably have IDs that are created on the Varus chain, but they are not the root IDs and people with root IDs would be able to en enable these to be created or even earn by making their um, name or currency or whatever it is, um, you know, something that matters. And then the other really interesting thing is that if you think about 
well, how does that payment model work in the world of, um, you know, of fully decentralized currencies? And it, somebody posted on Twitter, you know, that uh, for software development, open source is like um, compound interest in finance. And it's really, it's, I, it was a really perfect analogy to what I replied to, you know, and we need more composable technologies. And so if you're able to create these inexpensive IDs that are kind of automatically imported to the various chain, because that's all the only chain that they're created on. Now, they wouldn't be able to launch a currency off of Varus, and they wouldn't be able to launch a blockchain off of Varus, but they could be less expensive, and they could be paid for in the currency that defines them. Now, if you think of them as being paid for in the currency that defines them, and it's a centralized currency, well, that kind of is easy because then whoever controls the centralized currency uh, could earn from, you know, they could be sent the amount for that ID. You know, you could buy it from them, basically. Um, so that's that's one option for centralized. But when you talk, talk about decentralized, you know, there isn't really a person who should get uh, that currency if it's really decentralized. There is not an entity or person, even though, on contracts, you know, typically there is an actual entity, you know, and they, um, we don't have to go into detail about how centralized or decentralized those things are, but, but the point is there's not, uh, there's not um, a model exactly that fits for sending it to someone, but it's really kind of beautiful because our technologies Every time we run into something like this, they keep showing how they compose. And so the way that, you know, kind of the obvious way of solving this would be, say you have a decentralized liquidity basket that can issue currencies. Now, remember the model for licensing of the value uh, IP portfolio is to burn a certain amount the current model is to burn a certain amount of the currency meaning anyone holding that currency benefits every time anyone licenses um you know technology in that portfolio and in the same way for ids it would i think really be nice if you could have say a fractional liquidity basket if it were to issue, if it were to enable purchasing of IDs, imagine that you could purchase IDs from that fractional currency with the dot name of the currency after that. And uh, you would just simply pay in that currency and burn it. And because that fractional currency could conceivably have a dollar um, reserve in it, you could even conceivably, I'm, I'm not saying all these features are going live. I'm saying this is what I'm thinking right now and I, I not a promise. You could conceivably burn a certain specific amount denominated in any currency that's in the reserve basket. Um, so kind of very interesting that that would be enabled. Also for fully decentralized currency, you could just imagine you know, there might be a burning model, but I'm actually right now kind of along the lines of thinking that maybe only fractional currencies can issue IDs because in doing so, um, you know, there's basically a value exchange that is completely decentralized. And if we did something like that, it would enable, uh, you know, any business or anyone to have a source of inexpensive IDs that were not at the root, that did not um, provide all of the benefits and the ability to take resources from the main Varus chain to do currencies, to do you know currency launches, which is kind of a mix. It's not just taking resources, but the point is that it enables us to have 
a kind of second tier of identities on the platform that based on the current economic model, when we think about it in uh, separate blockchains and importing currency or importing IDs and things like that, is just making a certain user experience a little bit easier and not really um, in any way hurting the economic model. I think it just helps actually. I, th I think it also enables more um, easier business adoption because then businesses can make it easier to uh, create IDs as well. So that's that's kind of my my thinking and about a new um, thing that I would think I'm I'm hoping could be part of pulling the DeFi technologies and multi currency and everything else forward, um, you know, and then having the uh, bridge be a thing after that, as long as we make sure that we have this liquidity plan in place. So I'm open to any thoughts, comments, questions, opinions. Um, but again, I'm going to say that really is that this time I think is all that I've got. Would there be a, a premium for this kind of um, fractional currency to launch? Like the, there is a premium to launch a PBAS chain. Not sure. I don't know that it's needed. I mean, we have 200. I almost, I don't know. I actually don't know if our price on the fractional is quite um, high enough, honestly, but I, I don't really see a need for a premium for that because I, I don't want people to make chains just for a simple financial benefit that is kind of this immediately captured financial benefit as much as I'd rather see people making chains to expand the scale and capability of the network and keep the economics and coinomics in reasonable ranges. So I'd like to see, you know, kind of volume on Varus pushing people out to the edges. And in a way, you know, this change in the plan, um, although I, I would have liked to see it happen differently, you know, this change in the plan may end up kind of naturally resulting in more of that dynamic, but I don't, I don't really, I mean, this is not, I don't think that there are lacking financial incentives in our model right now for people who are miners and stakers on the chain. And if we enable this kind of a model, I think that there would be, we could conceivably enable a cost for people who made um, their own non-fractional currencies, we could conceivably enable a minimum cost that would be like an import cost. And for people who made their own, own fractional currencies, I'm not trying to actually figure out how to make it as expensive as possible, or I'm actually trying to figure out how to make it as inexpensive as possible while still, you know, kind of fitting in with the overall economic model and, and only making, only kind of, composing and adding to things but i don't see an immediate need i'd rather have as many currencies as possible have that capability and maybe there's a premium for a fractional currency and that goes along with it but you know i don't know i mean i'd really like if people have opinions right now i think that it's it's really about looking at the general econo economy of how things work because all the numbers of what Varus is worth, in my mind, it's, it's meaningless right now, the way that I'm thinking about things. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what Varus is worth right now. What matters is like almost all these prices, I believe, in the future are going to be pretty expensive. But that's just my belief. And, and, you know, because it's a certain percentage of the entire supply, which doesn't go around that much when things start getting busy and we're not doing this to make it so that things don't get busy. So it seems to me that, you know, I'm not sure. I think it would be easier in the future to raise the price than it in fact would be to drop the price of something like that. Interestingly. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily anticipate a specific ID premium right now, but I don't know if people think it needs to be there. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that it does. Yeah, it sounds like um, if you just wanted to use an ID for everyday payments, then there's no reason for you to get a main VRSC uh, ID, really, because if if the the sub ID has all the benefits, would you would the would you really only need a main ID to create more elaborate things, or or is that not the thinking? Well, I mean, a main ID is the most valuable ID right now, and it does enable a blockchain and it does enable a currency on main, you know, on Barris. And it, in this case, it would enable the minting of effectively, you know, an unlimited number of IDs and none of the other IDs would do any of that. They would have the capabilities of use, you know, which in fact, um, if those are then more easily available to people, could result in uh, in people, you know, in more businesses starting up and saying, "Hey, here's a model where I could um, I could create these IDs that I use for my business." Because you know, when we did, I did a social network that was purchased by Microsoft, um, you know, called Web Fives, and I I remember all sorts of we did a lot of id work you know because it, it really matters um obviously for a social network how you handle identity and uh you know one of the big challenges is that to get any kind of account related or identity related or even just identity services from anywhere it costs money you know, people sell identity infrastructure, they sell identity services. And if you want to talk about digital signatures, aside from crypto and what's happening today, you know, which is going to completely disrupt that market and I think take over, um, you know, it's expensive, they're expensive. And so this is an enabler for businesses to actually create and, and provide to customers identities that provide security in their funds and everything else that can then be used along with those services and don't require those services to have custodial roles. And so, you know, I think all of that is very powerful from an enabling perspective. And at some point, it's only going to take, you know, one success and that's what we should want as a community it's only going to take one success of a business using this technology that gives them advantages over other businesses which many of these technologies do to get an avalanche of other businesses and i don't mean that in the sense of the protocol obviously of other businesses moving over to get those same benefits that is how it generally happens so if we're right that we're building these technologies that enable these scenarios, which they do, and if we make them available to businesses to create business models over, then people who create businesses are going to come and use them in order to create these different businesses, applications, and these kinds of things. And that's how we really bootstrap the overall ecosystem. But we need basic world-class user experiences and liquidity on top of all the platform technologies that we have. And I think that's, that's where we are right now. We, you know, we crack those two things and then I think it's a, it's a completely different picture um, going forward in terms of, you know, then we would be able to have, you know, as soon as we get the extension and, you know, basic pieces, even if we don't have, all of the super construction tools yet for every random person to make user generated things, you know, then it's like, yeah, sure. Rarible would be great or, but I'd love to see digital nation entertainment release a fantastic metaverse marketplace, you know, and, and so um, I think it's about enabling the next step 
And I think that the IDs, the functionality that you would get from an ID that is a second level ID, because it's, it's built into the protocol that the, you know, the first level IDs are the ones that can start currencies and chains and there's a reason for that. And so like a second level ID, um, being able to be less expensive. So everybody now who has an ID might, you know, get a couple second level IDs and then they have their revocation, their recovery, you know, people who really only care about that level of security and they're not thinking about, I want an OG ID or I want to start, you know, a business or I want to create a line of NFTs and I want my ID to be cheap or these kinds of things, you know, um, that's what I'm thinking. I see people are asking about the um, the prices, uh, and, and actually, I, I think I, I think I wasn't clear because yes, we we actually have many oracles all over the chain when DeFi goes live. We don't need any external oracles, and yes, we can absolutely price like okay, we can. Let me let me let me back up. First, I didn't promise that we're going to be able to get this in. I would like to, I'm looking at it and working on how to get that in. Um, second, any fractional basket always knows its price in any of its reserves. So any fractional basket that had dollar reserves, at least technically speaking, could price identities in dollars. If it has Varus reserves, it could price its identity in Varus. You see, that's kind of the, the point, that you could conceivably just set the price in whatever currency you think um, would be, you know, easiest. And so anyways, that's, that's, that's my current thinking of what we might be able to do. Uh, true, but it's subject to that now. And if, oh, oh, okay. So I, I think that might answer the question people are asking, hopefully. So Lynn is asking, without ETH bridge, people would need to do KYC in order to use Verus DeFi via stablecoin, fintech company, wire, or Verus D. So two things about that. To go in and out of a bank account, if you're going to have a bank account, you've got your KYC on your bank. To go in and out of a bank account to the blockchain, yeah, you're gonna need to go in and out of fiat to crypto. I don't know how to do that without KYC. And I, I saw somebody mention, I think it was E. Juliano, who I don't know if he's on, I don't see him on, um, mention this uh, TB DEX that um, Jack is promoting and, and what they're actually talking about. So first I'll, I'll move to that after this, but um, so yes, you would need KYC to go in and out of bank, banks and fiat coins, but uh, you don't need KYC to go in and out of any currency that's on the blockchain, including, you know, Verus D or um, other stable coins that might be there. Uh, when we launch with liquidity, that will be liquidity there. It's just that the original Liquidity coming in and converting will be something that people, you know, either on the mobile phone or depending on when that's available on the browser extension would, you know, send their, uh, basically send that in. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, we're still, I know that he's been swamped, but it has been, I think, based on other issues unrelated to us or Varus. But the head of uh, Safe Trade, still like last I talked to him, even just a few days ago, sounds like we're going to get uh, stablecoin markets there as well, and like I don't know exactly when, but I as far as I know, they're like very, 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 very soon. <laughs> I don't know exactly when, um, but. It seems that I don't know, uh, there's no barrier as far as I know, except he just needs to finish it. 
along with all the other things going on. And then um, I would see no reason why we wouldn't want to have, you know, Varus D in a market against other stable coins, you know, paired with other stable coins. And I would, uh, you know, I'd place a bet that that wouldn't, that he, that safe trade would be happy to, you know, enable that. So I don't think there's any way that it ends up being, I don't, so here's my view. The liquidity is critical. We need to, you know, the, the plan was to roll out DeFi connected to the rest of the entire, um, like crypto world. And we will be there. We will get there connected to the rest of the crypto world. Um, but right now, I think uh, our goal is to roll out DeFi and to have enough liquidity to make it, you know, the beginning of a growing liquid network that we would then plug in to Ethereum early next year. And at that point, I think we'd have even a bigger center of gravity. We could get the word out. Everybody would know that it's coming. And But it's not about what's coming. It's that we have, you know, the MEV resistance that we started this conversation on, that we actually have a better solution, that we have a more um, fair simultaneous solving model, as well as, uh, you know, lower conversion fees and fully decentralized, rug-free. I mean, on decentralized currency, you can't pull the funds out. Nobody, nobody has a contract ability to pull the funds out. It's just the whole network securing every single liquidity basket. So, um, yeah. So that's, that's where things are. Did that answer your question, Lynn? Thank you. So I take it that people like the less expensive secondary, you know, uh, second level ID thinking. I... Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's actually... Uh, Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, that's the goal is basically business enablement. And it isn't just, it's not, you know, oh, I said I was going to correct. I mean, we knew it was coming, but it was bound as well to PBAS and this lack of future security. I'm not sure I understand the question about lack of future security. I don't, I don't know of uh, any impact on security from this. Except that, you know, one thing we want to make sure of is that when we release a technology, we absolutely believe, and we've gone through it, you know, countless times, and we believe that we should be releasing that technology. That's kind of an important thing, but I don't. I I don't understand the question, Lynn. And so Tango eight hundred eight. Yes, the. I mean, we knew it was coming, but I think the big difference is just that. Okay, so this will be on Varus, but I think it's the right way to do it because, um, it is an important part of enabling these other currencies and knowing where they come from to have them coming off of the root of where they were defined. And so this would just, I, I just feel it, it helps to solve, you know, both. Yes, we all know that businesses don't want to be paying, you know, 180, 60, 40, or they don't want to pay, and people would prefer not to pay 20, but 
20 is not that bad, but we also all probably believe that it's not always going to be 20. And at that point, it starts to become, you know, back to the kind of original or more. And, and then the question, in, you know, that we have is, um, or, or, you know, we don't know the, the future, but the point being that um, we believe, I think we all believe that there needs to be a way for people will for people to be able to get um, access to identities and for businesses to know that there is a stream of identities that won't price their model out of working. So, okay, Lynn is saying the problem is lack of future security. You want to have a business run on a chain which will run indefinitely. Can any other chain except the main chain? Oh, oh, I see. Um, I see what you mean. You meant that if you wanted to go onto a a PBAS chain, uh, would that have the same level of security as running on Varus for the long term of your identity? And I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean that's a a fair point, but I think I hope and believe that uh, there will be projects that launch from Varus, hopefully like value early on and other projects that, you know, have the, the goal and the vision and the means and, you know, to, to last indefinitely, as long as, you know, are we or any of these others that are talking about, you know, human, the future of humans, um, and then evolving to be something else as time goes on. But yeah, I mean, that's the, if a chain launches and it's a project that um, that doesn't last, then uh, you could always export your ID from that project, though, to other chains. And no matter what happened to that project, those IDs that are exported are actually like kind of a fork of the original ID. They're like, you know, um, you know, Mike at NFT. You know, it really is like that. Like you can, in fact, use that if you ever want to send to an ID. It's a little Easter egg that uh, I don't know if it's documented. If you want to send to an ID on another chain, instead of using export to, I'm sorry if anyone's going to be upset that they didn't know this before because I've just been uh, uh, busy and working on other stuff. You can do, you know, uh, Mike at uh, Moon. And it will go to the mic ID on the moon chain. Uh, so you can do you can do that. But so so you know it you could concede, but it wouldn't be the original one and it would no longer have the power that it had on that chain, but that was kind of a, a thing, a, a property of that chain anyway. So so in a way it's not it's interesting because you can even send your assets off of one chain to another. You know, if a chain is is kind of losing its power, you can send its assets away. Um, get taken down. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, you know, it always depends on the chain. How decentralized will it be? How how easy would it be? You know, like if it's a centralized one and someone decides to take it down, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Lynn was asking, in case for anyone's not looking at the marketing uh, chat, how much time would there actually be left for such an export if that PBS chain were to get taken down? But of course, if I were to make before, see, here's the other thing. We were talking about making PBS chains. And, I, and by the way, now I'm sounding as if this is already like done. It isn't done. I don't know if this is going to be in until PBAS, but I do think even with PBAS, that this model should be in. And I do have the question of whether or not the, you know, we might want to make the price a tiny bit higher for launching currencies or a little bit higher. Um, does anyone have any opinion on that? Just curious. I'm not saying that I think it should be. I just don't know. 10K for launching a currency, Bishop, did you mean? Oh, no, I, I'm, I actually feel, I feel like our price and the model 
with the launch of a chain and a gateway, I think it's actually kind of, it really seems good in my opinion. Um, when it comes to a currency, I mean, uh, you know, Chris asked the question, should we have a premium for the IDs? And I don't think that we should necessarily have a premium for the IDs as much as, you know, uh, is 200 Varus for launching a currency, um, you know, too low? And I have been kind of wondering like 200 to 500 or something like that. You know, I, I look, this is absolutely not a prediction and it's not something anyone should rely on. You know, I'm optimistic for the value. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't make price predictions, but I have, uh, I have optimism that leads me to believe that we need to be careful about, you know, setting it too high. That's all. Um, so, because I actually just think we're, as much as we'd like to go and say it, and we're literally undiscovered in a certain way, in my opinion. But that's my opinion. That's just my opinion. And and part of it has to do with now is time to have world class experiences, and the liquidity that we all want to see. You know, we gotta focus on the work to get those things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, sorry to uh, interrupt you, Mike, but uh, to get back on the uh, price of a currency launch, I think 200 uh, Verus is a steal, uh, as it is set at the moment. Um, one of the reasons uh, that we discussed before in the marketing meeting to uh, put up a price of 10,000 Verus for a chain is amongst other things uh, the availability of people that is able to help the people that want to uh, start up a chain. Uh, the same issues exist with the currency. If you don't do it wrong, you miss out and you throw away uh, an ID plus the virus. And another thing is uh, skin in the game. I think you need to have some skin in the game that you don't uh, put up an, uh, yet another, excuse my words, shit coin, shit token, uh, and don't take any responsibility for it. And some level of investment in that token uh, makes it easier to do stay in touch, stay connected to it. it. It's not something you easily abandon because you put money in it. So I think, uh, yeah, 500 sounds like a reasonable number to me. Yeah, Tango, I, I, the, the discussion you're wanting, to, there's, it's really hard to solve that, really hard. There's no way to measure value that I know of at all. Um, and that's just what, you know, a centralized group can do is, is a prediction of net present value and all this stuff. And I, I, I don't know how to put that into a protocol. Um, so the, and I, and I don't believe if we can figure out a way that it's, it, I, I mean, I actually, it's not true. I can think of ways to do it, but it requires things to be bootstrapped first. Um, <clears throat> that's the way I would think of it. So. I, here's the thing, exactly Hyperdex's point is my concern, actually. I, I, you know, look, I don't believe that we're doing this project and that we're, you know, I don't believe, like, I'm not, the reason that I'm doing this is not to have, you know, is not to, like, make myself rich or to have a, and 60 or 80 million dollar market cap project is to change the world i mean that's the reason that i'm doing it i don't know about everybody else and if we're going to do that <clears throat> you know uh i don't want to i don't want to talk about numbers in future but um 500 might be a reasonable price the thing that i'm that i'm it's not about being a shit coin it's about uh and i have i'm starting to have a 
forming an idea, but every complication in the protocol, every like special case or, or this kind of thing, um, it ends up being work and things take longer. That's just the way it is. So uh, when we make composable, elegant things that we can do and get them together, then it works better. And you can enable many, many things with just a few different options, you know. And, and so the um, uh, 500 seems reasonable. Yeah. Uh, um, and and not, not even 500 times one, honestly, if, if Varus, by the time we get to say 20 or, you know, even far north of that, whatever it happens to be, uh, then we'll have, like, we really should have um, PBAS live, which would mean that <laughs> there's a pressure release valve. You know, it's not, that isn't that much of a problem. But the thing that I'm wanting to see is these are decentralized, these are fully decentralized currencies and we can have as many as we want. And 200 allows people, many, maybe many more people to feel like they can afford to make at least, you know, liquidity baskets. Now, if you, if you have, so right now the DeFi, nobody uses it on testnet and we probably should start using it. You might want to think about using it. <clears throat> when you make a basket, you can adjust the percentages of each of the components of your basket to be like a, a balance, you know, it's like a, it's a balanced reserve basket of currencies that is impacted in different percentages, you know, by the appreciation or depreciation of the currencies in it. I mean, it, it really is that. And, and so you can say, oh, I want it to be, you know, uh, fifty percent Varus and ten percent USDC and ten percent ETH and like this. And if you do that, um, you know maybe somebody else will like your basket and they'll just kind of want to hold that basket while it also grows and accrues, you know, fees of people using it to convert. And there's no chance for a rug pull when somebody makes a basket like that. It's only a question of are the reserves in that basket interesting and is the person, maybe someone would get a following by the way that they, you know, pick balances to balance kind of risk reward. And, and maybe they'll, you know, maybe there will even be um, <clears throat> some popularity in people who do that. So 500 maybe is the one, you know, um, 400 maybe, maybe 200. So everyone, is it that everyone does think 200 is too inexpensive? Uh, Hyperdex, no, I'm not gonna, someone else can. Uh, I'm not, I have no time for that right now. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm thinking something else. Uh, the price of 200, it's, it's not high, it's not extremely low. It, in my opinion, it's still a bargain. Um, a long time ago, uh, it was <laughs> Max. It was uh, sorry. It was yeah. When uh, uh, no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> uh, uh, quite some time ago, let me put it that way. Uh, the possibility was mentioned that uh, the foundation would uh, take on work and have community members do it. Uh, the foundation being paid and the community members doing the work, getting a bonus. Yeah, but we have plenty of work and there just aren't enough community members who are know, able to I do know, stuff who are kind of joining. Okay. So that, let's okay. not, like, we don't have let, the let overhead to do that unless, okay. yeah. Now, let me finish, please. Um, since uh, if they're cheap, there's going to be uh, interest in the currencies. And uh, these people can either make the choice uh, I'm going to do all the work myself and risk a failed launch and burn an ID and burn 200 Ferris. Or I can say, okay, I need help. I need this checked, etc. Uh, and they go through, through some channel uh, where they can get help, uh, but they are charged for that. 
okay. and in that way. Okay, but but Oink, I'm going to say two things because I want to answer dude here at the same time before that gets to be a conversation because uh, first, somebody has, that's like a business somebody has to make. Like, who's going to do that? It's not going to be anyone I know in the foundation because everyone in the foundation is just working nonstop like crazy and we'd love to have more people join to contribute, but it, that has to happen for that anything to change. And so I, I, I don't have interest in managing someone's money or some, you know, funds of things like that until, you know, we get finished with these pieces and we get these things done properly to mainnet and enable the partners we do have. And so, um, and then I want to respond to dude about this ETH contracts. Like what we do is nothing like an ETH contract. You know, we're talking about to actually write and make something like a sushi swap is most likely going to be millions of dollars. You know, the, the, it's like the tr cost of a transaction isn't the same as having a DeFi contract. And so when you enable a Kickstarter like capability, all these different things, you can't compare it to what would it cost after you've done all the work on a contract and everything else and then deploy it. So, but at the same time, <clears throat> I do, uh, I do believe like that those numbers, the 500 to 10 K that's like just the transactions required to deploy a contract or a set of contracts. It's really expensive. That's like to just um, after everything else is written and all the people have been paid to write all of the different things, you know, um, I think there's like $250,000 right now put into the Ethereum contracts by value so far, you know, that that would be included in that 500 to 10 K. And so, um, I don't think that's an apples to apples comparison at all is the only thing. Um, I'm agreeing on, I think the barrier needs also to be low. The, I do, do, do people think like this, this is something. So is there any model that could conceivably, you know, um, deter scams by making it so expensive, but still allow adoption. It seems to me that what we really need is an easy way to click on somebody. And if anybody's gonna make a, a currency, they should actually, you know, at least dox a pseudonymous profile of theirs that has some credibility in the world, you know? Or maybe you shouldn't believe them. Um, because we can do that with the IDs and the IDs were, you know, put before the multi-currency in order to enable us to be able to do that. That was the point. And so I think that we somehow have to figure out, yeah. So I think nobody's saying that we should be in the thousands. Um, right now, 200. Does 200 really invite scamming? Do people think 200 invites scamming? Right. So I'm agreeing with Hyperdex, right? Yeah. And Max, yeah. So then I, I don't think we necessarily should be above where we are. Then maybe we just leave it where we are until the ROI is bigger than the initial cost. I mean, when, yeah, what, yeah. Yeah, right. I, env I envisage to be a tab in the wallet or some app which allows you to browse projects that have been reloaded on Verus. And then, as you said, right. click on the ID, look at the, look at the credentials, look at the attestations, make your choice on an investment. And then that's the way of whittling out the scammers, not just by giving it, you know, a new token launching platform. You can just, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. That that that's the model that I think is right too. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, in fact, you know, um, uh, Juliano, I I actually uh, spoke about you when you weren't on yet, um, and I think uh, someone's got their mic on and is talking. Um, e. Juliano, I I mentioned that you know the TB Dex thing that you posted about on Twitter. Uh, honestly, I've never seen what pretends to be a grassroots project use all the corporate standards and embrace them and then be promoted by Jack of Twitter when they're basically they seem it seems to me like a little kind of the approach like blue sky kind of Bitcoin lightning um, you know it just seems really all part of that and I really I don't see anything that we should focus on doing along with the TB decks right now, because I actually don't believe it's any near term thing and it's going to end up being wired in with, uh, I think square and stripe and everything. <clears throat> and so I just a comment on that. I, I mentioned it because of that, uh, tweet, but I think on the, my model has also been, you know, so they have this idea of reputation that's been in the model that was in the vision paper of a long time ago. And we're set up to be able to do that. And the kind of thing that like Craigslist, you know, Craig, Craig, when you said things to think about, I mean, um, you know, if there's a, it would not necessarily be super hard to enable attestations to just be posted that could be, you know, even like, a, I, it's a little bit dangerous in my opinion to, um, to do it without a plan because we don't want to create something that turns into a real social problem that we didn't anticipate. But as far as reputation goes, we definitely have the tools for people to write apps to enable all the kinds of reputational things that, that people talk about with attestations and everything else. And, you know, the model, I, the model that Chris described and looking at projects and, and even bubbling them up based on, you know, things you care about. And that is exactly what we should get to at some point, I think. Okay, thank you for um, for mentioning that. Yeah, about the uh, the TB Dex, and I it I wasn't sure, I wasn't clear, and that's why I, I'm I'm glad that it's looked at, and and I feel the same way as you do in sense that it's kind of a a certain club that's already being formed or has been formed, and that's just working in that direction. And I think uh, it's the it's same. I think it may be the same club. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not even I'm just thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so that's cool, and it's interesting to just to hear your perspective on it. That uh, whatever timelines and and that sort of thing. So that's fine. Uh, as far as like this, I, I I realize I'm just catching this mid mid conversation, but I realize you're talking about the concerns about scammers and currency launch, um, fair pricing and stuff like that. But uh, I get the sense that um, people people. I I mean it. You just mentioned that that you could get apps that have verifying, and it, that was kind of what I was thinking too. So that's good. That I guess that takes care of it for people who want to be ultra safe and ultra, you know, um, with that type of thing, versus just also having the ability for anybody to participate as at least with a little barrier, but still a low enough barrier that people are very still interested and looking to create, be creative and have fun and and try things out and see what works, what doesn't work. And, um, and yeah, and then, you know, there can be channels through which people can verify whether a certain currency is uh, legitimate or not. And like you said, pretty much it, it would be hard to, to scam people. There would have to be very specific ways that people are scammed. Is that correct? No, no. I think what I was talking about is rug pulls specifically on the decentralized fractional currencies. So, a rug pull, you know, typically refers to when people can access the funds in some way or other outside of the normal protocol, which there just isn't a way. And so it's fully, you know, it's decentralized in Mike, the protocol. Mike, you had yeah. mentioned 
you had mentioned, or maybe I had read somewhere that maybe somebody could enable it so that uh, the <clears throat> owner of the ID can print as much of the current the currency as they want. So then they could use that to basically flush out the 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 fractional reserve. Right, and that's a centralized uh, currency, and that's like obvious. Everyone can see that that's a centralized currency. It's a, it has to be defined in a way that lets you do that. So, for example, uh, Veris D would be a centralized currency run by the automated system, the automated technology behind the irrevocable trust, where you know exactly dollar for dollar, you know, cent for cent, money comes in, goes to the blockchain, money goes from the blockchain, goes out. <clears throat> but, but that's that is a specific use case. Just like if you know J.P. Morgan says they're going to make a, a fund or something, then they're going to want to do it with an easy way of minting more of of the fund. You know, <clears throat> and so uh, as far as scamming, we can always see that something's decentralized or not. But, you know, when you do a launch, you can set it up so that you take funds from that launch. I mean, just like you can do on Ethereum or other any other platform. So we don't have any like we have IDs. We have the ability to you know make I like uh, Spike mentioned, you know. Um, this idea of if you wait, then the price goes down. I actually really kind of like that idea. Um, but I don't know if there's some reasonable, easy way to make that, uh, you know, kind of a, an easy to describe a solution, but it's, an, it's a really interesting idea. <clears throat> or easy to describe, easy to implement, you know, all these things in a kind of a generalized solution, but I, I, it's an interesting idea. Um, I also don't know if it would work or not, but it would also make, you know, it'd be kind of a trade-off. How long do you want to wait versus how much do you want to pay? I, kind of interesting. Um, you know, and during that time you're waiting, maybe it gives you a little bit of time to actually like set up your ID and if you don't have an ID, well, geez, you had all that time, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, model, I, I think. Um, so I don't think we have any magic bullet yet for <laughs> Max. <laughs> I don't think we have any um, magic bullet yet for stopping scammers, but we do have reputational tools. People can write apps that do that. We have the ability to do profiles right now that allow people to prove things. And we can kind of have, you know, set a best practices kind of community standard level of what it is. But we also, I also envision these to be usable for, you know, um, an event that might even want to do a pre-sale of tickets and if they didn't get a certain size, you know, attendance that the event wouldn't happen, things like that. And so I'm just, I like the idea of keeping the price in, at some balance where it isn't too expensive. And as everyone's been kind of mentioning, you know, people can experiment with different use cases. And I'm thinking through this discussion that probably our long-term solution for scams, because it really isn't about the price, it really isn't. Our long-term solution for scams is the IDs, reputation, and this, and that, um, <clears throat> you know, we might want to consider some kind of, like, objective check checklist that we could, as a community, create for projects or things that launch. And and Hyperdex asked about, you know, use cases and, and user stories. I, I'm not, we're, I'm not going to have time to do those or react to those right now. We're going to have to use, you know, experience, understanding of the market, intuition, and, you know, not that process now. But that same kind of thinking um, could, could really enable uh, models for how we would expect different kinds of use cases maybe to represent themselves, you know? to like, if you're, this is what we'd recommend for a Kickstarter. These are the important points that you should look for if you're going to 
care about like just some com you know friendly community guidelines that at some point could just be kind of put into you know fractional currency look for this you know if it's a centralized currency they can mint currencies make sure you figure out you know big red you know make sure you figure just just as a kind of community help for anybody looking at how because all of unlike any other platform, all these properties are completely transparent because it's not hidden inside the code of a contract. But we do all these same things and you can, and it's composable because it, you know, it works. And so I think maybe instead of user stories, that same kind of energy that would be put in or, or you know, effort that would be put in by people who would be working on thinking about putting something like that together might think about could we get together some, um, you know, how to DYOR for uh, Kickstarter presale or not? We, should, we, we can't say Kickstarter. I should stop saying that. For crowdfunding presales, for, you know, fractional currency launches, for um, centralized currency launches. And then, you know, uh, things to look out for and then maybe from that we might even be able to make sure that our GUIs when we're looking at these things kind of show these points but somebody's got to spend some time to um, to describe what those things are to put that together and it won't be the people developing and, and getting this stuff together right now so we'll need help so if anyone wants to start working on that um would be fantastic because i think that could be useful i mean i think it could be maybe do, do people agree does that sound reasonable does that sound useful yes it does sound useful um how how much would somebody need to know in order to do this without bothering too many people that need to not be bothered well i'm not volunteering anyone but I'm gonna guess, first of all, I think the, um, I think it was Tango 808, was it, who made, I don't, I don't wanna incorrectly attribute the, that, that really cool graphic that we got recently, just recently, that one. Um, where is that? That, that was Tango built it off. Yeah, Tango. that's what. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So, um, you know, if we could get something so easy to see, I know that I think uh, maybe Quox has made some similar kinds of easy things. Max has made some easy, really easy infographics. Tango eight hundred eight. I don't know who else. You know, E Juliano, you brought together some stuff. I. The point is that. If we can get that kind of, and it doesn't have to be tomorrow. I mean, the time that this should be is like, we'll know, we'll, we'll have another meeting before we'll have knowledge of when, you know, this is gonna be available, when it's gonna be released, when it's gonna be active on mainnet. And the idea would be that when there are currencies and currency launches and all this ability rather than as people have pointed out you know trying to um gate it by price which might also gate the growth maybe leave it where it is and then uh solve the question of ids in the way that we're describing and then um provide you know like a really easy community, you know, PSA for doing research in the Veris ecosystem because we, unlike other platforms, make all of these things transparent. And it's another significant and kind of unmatched strength that we have in our network. So let's flex a little bit on that. And if we could, that would be fantastic. I think that could be useful. So for somebody who wants to be safe and DYOR on a, a currency launch, 
Um, one thing that would help them is if they write a command and then look at what comes up for specifics. And if those are there, they would either be red flags or they would say, is that, is it, that, can um, it be that I, I think, simple? I think, I think it needs to be much simpler than that. I think at the level where, remember, everything now we need to be thinking like mass market, it's a way to communicate to somebody. So it needs to be no command. It's not about the command. It's about the properties. Like, is it centralized? Because then we have to expose those properties in easy ways. And we have to tell, how do you find out if it's centralized with a command? I literally, that was my question. Okay, I'm glad you said that. So and, okay. so and so the point is that it's just, it's at a, it's at a level that anyone, even a no, no crypto person will be able to see and say, okay, these are the things that matter. And maybe then there's a little kind of hints or pointers to where you're going to be able to figure this out. But no, we need to get away from, it's not about commands that people have. There's no, no mass market person who comes to our platform and starts using it is, you know, if we think about it in high percentage, meaning, meaning like 99%, 99.9, the bigger we get, the higher that number is going to look at something about commands. So how is you know, somebody that's using that way, uh, how are they interacting with that currency launch to begin with through the, through the wallet interface, right? It, 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 okay. It's true that what I'm trying to get away from is these questions, but no, oh. I'll, I'll answer them. I'm not, okay. no, I'm not trying to say, I know you can ask any question, but I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to answer you. I'm sorry. I'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not making myself clear. My okay. point is that we need to communicate that these are the aspect because they're general like how centralized is it well we can tell you and here are the ways you can find out that's when you direct them to the command the question we don't take it from okay right now today at this moment before we're finished with other stuff we have a desktop or we have a, co a command line we say what are the concepts that matter the you know, we look at it from the other direction. You look at it from the, if you want to do research, it matters what you said before is what matters. That somebody can print more of that currency and dilute the currency at will. That even a group of people could do that at will. Even if it's a DAO that they can do that. You want to know that if they can do that, that you know that. And that you consider that, and we want to tell them, you know, if you're going to, it doesn't mean that a currency is bad. It means that it's not a trustless currency. It's something that really depends on your level of trust of the identity that is making that currency because they have the keys to the money, basically. You know what I'm saying? And, and it so. can be a, yeah. a large group. It can be a large group. And so I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm, I said it incorrectly. It's not that I don't want the question. It's that that question as the one that we answer in the material that I'm envisioning isn't the question that we answer because it isn't, a, it's not a how to guide of how to use our applications or our command line. It's a, how to guide of what are the important things that you can learn from the various platform about a launch that you really need to consider when considering if you should participate in a launch or put your money into a liquidity basket or you know these kinds of things or you know do a pre-sale um do you know what i'm saying and, and, and it's yeah, just, it's, I do. I think yeah, I think yeah. you mean like I think you mean basically how to th how to think about it when you're doing your own research. How do you think about this stuff? Afterwards comes how to actually look at it, but what you should be thinking about in order to make sure you are doing your own research. It's that plus the fact that everything is something that Varus does make possible for you to just see, which then depending on what you see leads you to some other level of research like that. And in some cases, don't accept something with these kinds of things set. 
you know, and you know, unless it's, yeah. you know what I mean? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, makes sense. Totally, 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 totally. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and one thing that we need to think about as far as if we make it educational materials versus like public service announcements, like our and and I'm Project Override uh, mentioned education materials around contributing funds to a currency launch. As a community, um, our job should be cautionary. You know, it's uh, it's not. Um, I. I wouldn't like everybody can we can have you know promotional youtubers and and hopefully some of the you know highest credibility ones over time and this kind of thing but uh, and different people in the community can promote in different ways and I and when we educate people we really have to be careful we are not you know about kind of crossing this line we're not trying to um we're, we're not trying to necessarily tell them what are the best things or how to identify the best things as much as I think our, our responsibility, no, it's not a responsibility actually, it's not. It's not an obligation, it's not a responsibility, yes, PSA. To, to basically, to, to make some best practices by making these PSAs, if we do a good job, if somebody can put them together properly and, and, and we do a good job on them, it would define best practices by people who want to launch currencies for different user stories and use cases is my thinking. Anyways, I think, um, I mean, that's, that's more than all I had. And actually it looks like I need to, I kind of need to go. Um, and this has actually been a super useful conversation for me. And I appreciate all the, I mean, this has been, the most kind of discussion that I remember in a long time. And I really appreciate it because I'm going to be thinking about all of these things. And I know a lot of people will. And, uh, and I don't know actually where we landed on the pricing, but where I thought we landed and I just want to confirm is that based on all we're thinking, we're going to really focus on, on helping to, as project over, I said, educate people about the things to like, be careful of like we want to do these cautionary PSA type things. We I hope that we'll be able to bring something like that together. Um, and my focus and other developers' focus is going to be to you know really narrow down and get this kind of the MVP of the next major upgrade together as soon as possible by kind of separating out the pieces that are there now and then enhancing with a little bit of the discussion here and um and so i really appreciate that but i'm thinking that we are still on track if i'm not mistaken for the uh 200 varus currency or max had mentioned 250 I, I don't know if that makes that much of a difference but i think the idea of leaving it open for um experimentation and use by more people seems good and then the other thing is this you know this really interesting idea from spike about the you know longer an id like you, you don't just come grab an id make your currency scam everybody you know maybe there's a time factor and history that can be built up and this kind of thing but i really like this idea that maybe we could have some DYOR, you know, PSAs from the community because we're a community and we want people to, we want people to build successful businesses on this platform across the world. And we want people to use this platform to move into the next generation of how people do commerce. And um, so it just seems to me that that would be a nice starting point and kind of gift to the community if we could do that and and max has a good point as well that's true so anyways um i'm gonna i'm gonna probably just listen to see what other people have to say and then uh, drop off 
and really appreciate everyone's contribution to the discussion and feedback and everybody joining and and so thank you and it also if i'm wrong about the current like we're leaving it at the 200 right now um and and other people got a different takeaway from that let me know but that's that's my takeaway from the discussion thanks If anyone has anything uh, to mention for the marketing meeting or wants to discuss or ask about marketing, uh, feel free to open up your mic and speak. If you don't want to speak, uh, type in the marketing channel. I'll uh, leave some time before I'll uh, close down the uh, meeting. Well, I interpret that big pause as no one has anything uh, to say right now at this moment. So I'm going to wish you all a uh, very good Saturday, Sunday, wherever you are in the world and whatever time it is uh, for you. I bid you a good day and hope to see you in the next meeting. Thank you very much for attending and bye-bye.